Hi, I have a question to Professor Thibault. Uh, so my question is, I want to know a uh, little bit about the historiography of the texts that you are talking about, the corpus of the text. You say that there is no anthology of or edited or collated version of all the Arabic uh, texts which were written in Bengali. So where were these texts procured from, the archiving of it? But there is still a tradition which was going on in the later part where these were procured and made an archive into. So uh, the manuscript that whoa, oh, uh, the manuscript that we have now are uh, are the ones that I <coughs> that I use so far are kept at the the Bangla Academy and the Dhaka University, and they were collected as so. Of course, first there is the the collection of uh, Abdul Karim Shahid Tuisharot uh, from uh, Chittagong, who on his own collected this very large collection uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Bengali text, uh, uh, mostly Bengali Muslim literature, but not only, and started as an editor uh, of, of texts that are not uh, Bengali Muslim texts. And, um, um, and, and this collection is the, the, I, I, is the one that really triggered the study of Bengali Muslim literature, and, and we have uh, uh, and it's the, the best known and, and best described collection we have uh, a, a descriptive catalog <coughs> very nicely preserved at the Dhaka University Library and, uh, and that's the easiest to use. Uh, the other big collection is uh, the collection of the Bangla Academy. And so when collecting manuscripts, he also collected, uh, because he really collected everything he, co he, he could get, and uh, and he was very interested in uh, in those uh, manuscripts in in Arabic script. He was absolutely not. Uh, uh, he didn't ex express the kind of. Uh, uh, I mean, he didn't consider that it was anecdotal and useless, etc. And uh, and the way he described those uh, those manuscripts is very interesting. He speculates about why even him, who is uh, someone who from you know the the first uh, half of the twentieth century and who witnessed uh, the living tradition around uh, those texts, even he uh, didn't know why, why people started writing uh, manuscripts in, uh, in the Arabic script, and he was really uh, speculating about it. He didn't write a lot about those things. It's interesting to see that uh, he could read them very well. Uh, there are very few <laughs> scholars who, uh, who actually uh, uh, used those, uh, those manuscripts, as I said, so we don't have edition, but even even uh, to use them for uh, critical edition and like collecting collating their their content um, there is one gulam uh, samdani uh, koreshi who uh, edited alaul stofa uh, he uh, discusses uh, some uh, of those manuscripts but to uh, and th the ones of the bangla academy so they are part of uh, an institutional effort to collect manuscripts uh, from the, the Pakistani period and then after on uh, through the uh, after the, the independence of Bangladesh and uh, and, and they were collected but again uh, there was it wasn't uh, uh, there was, uh, were collecting collected as part of a more general effort and there was never uh, any specific as we see for instance we see let Nagari today where there is a specific effort to collect those texts these manuscripts, they just happen to be collected with others. And, and, and that's why it's really <coughs> difficult also to, to locate them in the catalog, because they're not in one place. You have to go through all those things, and sometimes uh, they indicate, oh, and then, uh, mm -hmm. so we, we still have to, to do this work of uh, compiling a specific list of those things. And then there are still uh, several of those manuscripts in private hands today, in Chittagong. Uh, uh, one of the collectors for the Bangla Academy uh, it was not the Bangladesh uh, at the time, but uh, was uh, Isak Choudhury, uh, Abdul Sattar Choudhury, and his son, uh, Isak Choudhury, uh, in, uh, in the region of, uh, of Chittagong, uh, still has a, a, a large collection. And I, 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 I didn't go there myself, but I was told that there are fantastic manuscripts in Arabic script. Uh, one thing that should be done, though, because here I just mentioned those texts written in Arabic script that are in Bangla. It would be very interesting to collect Arabic texts from Chittagong. And this also, we, I don't think there is any collection, even of Quranic texts, for instance. 
I mean, what is the, 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 the history of the Quran in Bengal? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's still something that needs to be looked at closely. Yeah. It would be very Uh, my question is for Professor Tyler Williams. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, like yesterday we started our conversation on material materiality of these manuscripts and all the motifs, everything uh, like like we talked about here. So you started by saying like the di like the different uh, genre of poti, pustaka, and all of this. I was thinking, uh, what is the relation between circulation? Like who is owning what? Like who possess puthi, who possess pustaka, who possess other kinds of thing and other kinds of material object and how does that translate into the, perform the domain of performance? Like, uh, so for example, you talked about how uh, the author who is right, who is composing the manuscript, to him, it's uh, something that people will listen to. This is something that people will, you know, uh, it's not necessarily, it's, it will be read by um, the masses or a, a large amount of other people. So how does that transformation, transformation happen from the domain of a literary domain of from, from material object to, to a performance performance subject. So, uh, another question. So the other question is, uh, as as Professor Dubey uh, uh, showed the 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 geographical extent where uh, these texts were circulated. So could you please tell us about like where in North India or what was the extent of uh, these kinds of literature, which is like the Hindavi literature in in Persian uh, script. There is no, there is no writing without uh, performance. It, that's not actually completely true. There are documentary forms here. I don't want to make a. In fact, I'm already regretting that statement. I'd say that um, there's always. I mean, all of this written literature always, literature, kavya, right? Kavya, uh, uh, shairi, etc. We all know. We take it for granted that it has a existence in performance, right? That's the moment at which it's shared, at this moment at, at which it's learned, etc. cetera. Um, but it's clear that writing is always part of this process. And um, I mean, at this point in my work for me, uh, making, you know, making any type of clear distinction between the written and the oral doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, theoretically, it does no work for one. Um, as uh, as Thibault was saying earlier, silent reading was not part of this world, really. Um, uh, not at least not the worlds in which I work. That was silent reading was not the case. And um, well, okay. Let me let, let me find uh, the short way to uh, answer your question is that the composers of the Sufi romances were aware of they were aware of the significance of writing the vernacular. They were aware of the significance of its existence prior to that moment, or primarily as a language of song. And so in the Chandaya, and, uh, Malana Daud writes, Turki liki liki Hindu ki gai. He first starts by saying, Pied no akara ki sudi pai. Uh, Turki liki liki Hindu ki gai. Writing and writing in Turkey, Turkish, I sang in Hindu ki, right? Which he's making, you have to be careful about thinking about what kind of distinction is he making there. He's talking, uh, of course, not about the Turkish language per se, but he's talking about a script which is associated with <laughs> Turkish at the time, which, by the way, was uh, still in the, the, um, in the Tughlaq period when he was composing was still an important language in North India. Um, but anyways, the, the script is being used for Turkish, Persian, Arabic. That's the realm of the written in which he's composing this. 
but he's also acknowledging that um, this language in which people sing, in which, a and these sung folk ballads from which he took his material from the Chandaya, that language is what he is calling Hinduki, which again is a language of place, right? It's the language of the local, of the, of the region. And so um, all of the other poets as well have something to say about that distinction, and it changes over time. And if you really want to know about it, you can read the second chapter of my book, because I talk about, uh, shameless plug, how this changes over time. And there's also an association um, between the vernacular and prosody. Right? This is another important part. Anyways, th so that's one aspect of it. So it's always there. In, in other words, the short answer is, these two aspects, the written and the, the oral, are always there. The second question about the local. So these, these, uh, uh oh, oh, sorry, the, 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 with the, and, and feel free to jump in uh, at any point. The, I mean, in terms of place, I mean, these are being primarily composed in the Gangetic Plain, in what we now associate with kind of Eastern UP or UP in general. But the people who compose them especially in the, the later 17th and 18th century, were from all over. I mean, Surdas, who composed the Nal Damayanti, or Nal Daman, excuse me, is from Punjab, and he says so. And uh, he says that I use this language because this is the language of these Baim Katas, right? Um, and these Baim Katas, that particular copy is being uh, the copy of the Nal Daman at the, at the museum copied in 1698 is being copied for a general in the Deccan. Right, which tells you how far these, um, these stories circulated. And again, Thibault has written about this in The Shade of the Golden pa uh, Palace. Alaol is, you know, and Ada Khan is translating this centuries later, translating these, these stories centuries later and in a place quite removed um, geographically and somewhat linguistically from there as well. So they enjoyed incredibly wide dispersal. And again, this is the problem of reconstructing literary cultures in this period, is language does not correspond to place in the way we are used to thinking of. Sorry, that was a long question. Long answer. I have a question on the, on the one <coughs> don't, don't you think that Hinduki, Hinduki is not another rather than a, 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 a direct reference to I see the Tulki as uh, um, more derived from the Indic practice of, of design, designating the Yalan as the Turushkas, uh -huh. rather, which is a, a very broad uh, ethnic association rather than, uh, let's say, the linguistic domain of, of, of Turkey as, as such. So then, then it could be further to the, to the understanding of <coughs> oh yeah, yeah. In fact, thank you. That's a much better. That's a better way of putting it. Is that? Um, is I'm you know fumbling to come up for, uh, for the word as to what realm of uh, what what is the complete valence of this term Turki, or Hinduki. Right, Hinduki or Hinduki, it's, you find both variants in the manuscripts. Um, you said cultural practices. That's a nice way, uh, that's, that's a better word so than I can come up with. Right, I'm, I'm hesitant, right, to, to, ca to cast too wide a net for what these terms mean. Because there's not a lot, at least I've, you know, I've been reading around it and, and I've been reading uh, uh, about um, uh, trying to read up on that period, on the Tughlaq period, to get a sense of what kind of valence these terms have. And I don't have a good sense. My sense here, though, is because he is, first he's talking about, um, he's talking about uh, his education in Arabic with his period. And then suddenly he's, he shifts from talking about the, the na akara, right? Um, the, na, the na akara, sorry, the nine letters that he learned from his peer and getting the sudhi of them, right? The actual understanding of them to suddenly in the next ardhali, in the next part of the chopai, talking about this uh, turki liki liki hinduki guy, which I can only imagine to, to make such a sudden shift has to be something about 
uh, I compose within this world of adabiyat, yeah. right? But I am also I also have a foot in this world that I hear around me, that is sung around me, and, and it's this world that I think again he's not just again the valence the valence in Hindugi is not linguistic, right? It refers to a larger set of performative practices, uh, which happen to be in this regional language. But the Turki. Again, because it's Turkey and because, right, you, uh, like you're saying, this is, <laughs> these terms have some kind of meaning now that are broader. Uh, I'm gonna, maybe I will regret using this term, but the Turkey refers to something that is more cosmopolitan or something that reaches out to other places and regions, and the Hindugi refers to something that is much more here. usage of Turkish, in fact, in 15th century, when in pre-Mughal period, especially from Herat and Bukhara, they were trying to come out from the domain of Persian culture. And even prior to Alishir Nawai, they were trying to give more weightage to Turkish, in fact. And in all this uh, Khwarizm and Purasan area, they were trying to spread more Turkic rather than Persian, in fact. And this is the reason that Alishir Nawai and prior to him, other people, they had started to promote more Turkish one. And in India also, like in Bhopal, or in certain other regions, even till 18th century, majority of this Turkish origin nobility, they used to talk in Turkish in their family. They were not uh, using Persian as their uh, common language in their families, in fact. Even this 15th century, this like uh, Hakai, Hindi, and others, which were coming, they were using more kind of a secular tone that way. And even they were using words from Turkish rather than pure Persian or pure Arabic one. So do you find uh, any connection with this uh, Turki, Turki, and Hindi, Hindi, rather than they do not use the word Farsi, Farsi. They use the word Turki, Turki. What can be the reason? The Turkey is in the few sources, you know, I've read or read about from this period. I mean, who, who is the Turk? Yeah. I mean, the Turk is someone who's within the ambit of a sultanate or sub-sultanate court who has certain manners and who has certain tastes of that world. What is, I think, though, I mean, in this particular dichotomy or this particular um, uh, juxtaposition that's going on, the words that get me actually are, are liki. Hinduki guy, and I mean, if, if we looked at that, I mean, one way to look at it is to say, okay, Likki here in, in the old Purbi is an absolutive, Likkar, Hinduki guy, right, uh, 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 um, a perfective, right? So write, having written it or writing in Turki or something that's within that world or writing within the ambit of whatever is the Turkish, I sing or I sang. In, um, in Hindagi. Even if we say, okay, even if we treat it more loosely, treat the grammar more loosely, <coughs> and just say, okay, I write in one, we don't treat that first one as an absolute, I write in one, or I wrote in one, and I sang in the other, we're still getting a juxtaposition of something that's about writing, an inscription. And, the, and I did not, I wouldn't feel confident about that if I didn't see somewhat different pronouncements in, um, in Kutuban, uh, 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 Manjan, and um, Jaisi, because Jaisi, for example, says Baka Liki. He says, I write in ba Baka. Whereas here it's clear he's saying Turki Liki, Hinduki Gai. So there's some juxtaposition that's going on there. There is a difference. But exactly, but, I, but as you can tell, I'm not confident about what the full meaning of that term Turk or Turki. What is the Turki there, right here? There were not even in some cases 
people agreed to call themselves from the Mughals, in fact. And uh, many uh, such sources, even later on, the Mirza Namaz, which were written, they were calling them the Turks, not the Mughals, in fact. And they were having this kind of a pride to be a Turk, not from any Iranian asl. So they feel that the Turkish was more modernized, more having a capability of expression in very forms. In fact, Persian uh, gloss is lesser than the Turkish one. S a one word of Persian will have meaning even of 12 to 14 totally different meaning. While in Turkish, for one word, there will be many synonyms. So they used to say that Turkish is better than Persian, in fact. And they were maybe writing in Persian, but some way they feel that Turkish is better than Persian. I feel like I should be writing all this. Yeah. I mean, Hafiz was the Khali Hindu was Persian, Samarkand, Bukhara. That's still, he is giving preference to Turkish land. He is himself in Shiraz, the capital of the Sassanids and the Hakamanishis. But he is giving preference to Balkha, uh, Bukhara and Samarkand, mm -hmm. which was the seat of the Grand Jewry. Mm -hmm. So some of these uh, writers, even writing in Persian, but bringing word Turkish and Medicine. Assemblies from people for her. Like Turki Turki, it is usual. Anytime you will find the Irani Turki, you find the Turki Turki there. Yeah, I've read a little bit about uh, I've read a little bit about the, the Lionization of some Turkish forms that in the Kutluk period that stem from, from the Mamluk period yeah. and continue on. Yeah, in fact, I, yeah, this is something, again, I'm looking over at Thibault, I, I don't know much about this. One does not want to overstate the Persianate character of the early Sultanate, right? Um, Rather than referring to the reality of, uh, the, sort of, of uh, the place of an ethnicity within the society of its time, by, uh, or even less to the language, I think the, the language is not even really on the radar here, uh, uh, he's referring to this old Indic uh, use of Tulushka as the other, as the other Islamic. And that's why I was suggesting this, this parallel between. Of the, of the 
a distinct individual. Mm -hmm. The project of the Père Marchand is to say something in this, in this in limited garb. And so they're, I think, purposely using those ways to look at the other from within the Indian vocabulary. Mm -hmm. That's this, uh, I, I advocate for this idea that, and for other people have said that, that uh, we should not take the description of, uh, of uh, uh, religious aspects, ritual aspects, aspects of Hindu life and, uh, and, uh, and, and things in the, in the Premakian as ethnography. It's not ethnography. That it's, it's exotization. They're exoticization. They're, they're, they're describing something slightly exotic and they're playing with the, these, these descriptions of themselves through the lens of, 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 uh, of, of some kind of other. So I'm almost questioning the idea really put forward by uh, Aditya Benny in his work that, that, that uh, it's, uh, it's a, a way to bring, you know, to bring the Islamic hate in, in the Desi, etc. I think there is a slight instrumentalization mm -hmm. of Desi culture in this, in this game of, uh, of representing oneself through the, the eyes of another. And this to feed, so that's how I take this. So is there, uh, is there a kind of correspondence between these terms, Hindavi, Deshi, vernacular, um, in the sense that you cannot pin down either to a particular language, but depending on the context, it is, in, in, it is indicative of the local uh, or Sthaniya Bhasha uh, in uh, whatever the region may be. But it is, in a sense, also a negation. It is, it is that which is not. Sanskrit, that which is not Persian, that which is not English, right? I mean, we have ample colonial documents that also say, and then just in the vernacular. It doesn't tell you what vernacular, what language. and Brahman. It is amazing for me. And one question, just for knowledge, from that knowledgeable person, uh, Gurgani uh, Sangbat, uh, Gurgani ear mark was used in Mughal period sometime. Can you clear me? Gurgani is most probably Turkish. Please. In fact, all these Mughals, to whom we call Mughals, they were from the Gorkani tribe. And in fact, in Central Asia, they call Amir Tamil Gorkani. They don't like him to call Mughal in fact. Yeah, it is also. Yeah. I, I, some explanation from you. Yeah, I'm saying this uh, Gorkani, which is a tribe, and these uh, Indian Mughal emperors, whom we call Mughal, Great Mughals, 
they were all from the Chagatai larger group from the minor Gorkhan. And there are various dialects of this Turkic one. It is not Turkish, very frankly. The Turkic one has many. This is all Kazakhi, Uzbeki, uh, Turkmeni. The current language of these is basically Old Turkish. And now they may not be writing in the same script, but when they speak, if we just cleanse the Russian words or the other word, basically they use the same old Chagatai And Gorkhani is of the same part. Gorkhani is not a Persian. Is there any calendar, Sephardic calendar and weekly used by the Gorkhani? I couldn't get this. Calendar? Yeah. Gurkhani calendar was used in Mughal class, uh, by the Mughal class. I have uh, heard. Can you give me some example what kind of the calendar you are talking uh, The calendar which we were using either prior to Kulukbek, the other one, then Kulukbek made some improvements in that calendar. And most of these are from the Zijo Ulokhani, right? yes. which was later on adopted during Indian Mughals, even Zijo Muhammad Shai, which was compiled by Raja Jai Singh. Also was it was it his day? Hmm? His day was different. Base is the same. Basic. But in the same way as I yesterday mentioned about Tipu Sultan. Yes. He, he, he adapted a solar system. Yeah. He you, you started it from the birth of Prophet. Yes. Rather than from the migration from the city. From that the hijrat of Prophet. Yeah. Okay. begin answer very quickly or answer or continue the <laughs> reflection I have no answer uh, uh, yeah, I think you're perfectly right I mean if what you're suggesting is that those terms so vernacular deshi what was the third one there was a, sorry Hindavi. and Hindavi if they uh, so uh, yeah Hin Hindavi has really uh, uh, an equivalent of uh, or, or as part of the same paradigm I, I, I I, I'm still, I'm wondering a little bit about uh, about that, but uh, between uh, Deshi and vernacular, so we, that that that's the the thing. Can are they equivalent? I don't think they are because uh, uh, really, or at least if you understand vernacular in the context of of, uh, of those literatures, then we, we need to to add some something to it. You know, if we want to get closer to what Deshi meant, because. At, uh, so in a, I keep referring to it, but my book <laughs> uh, in uh, chapter seven uh, or six, uh, I uh, I I suggest uh, uh, going back to what I was saying about the uh, the idea of Awadi Premakian as uh, <coughs> looking at things from a distance, looking at uh, the, the regional culture from a, from from a, a distance. Um, if we look at the use of Deshi and Vidyapati is very important in this respect. So this passage that you quoted, I uh, comment on it at, at length. Um, I mean, not really at length, but uh, and uh, <coughs> I think, yeah, to basically uh, Deshi to me is not in the domain of literature. Again, we cannot apply it to all things, but in the domain of literature, it cannot be pure vernacular. It's not the pure domestic. It's not. It's not things. It's not equivalent with Tamil uh, in that sense. It requires a displacement, okay, uh, again. To me, Deshi aesthetic is, uh, is uh, an aesthetic of, uh, of, of near foreignness. Uh, it's, uh, almost, it's a bit counterintuitive because we would say, yeah, no, but no, Deshi is, is what I know, it's what at home, etc. But when you see how it has been discussed, going back to even the Himachandra and the Deshi Namamala, uh, uh, and what also Pollock said about, uh, about him, the deshi is not easy. It's never easy, and it's it's and it's interesting. And here it goes back to the the detail of uh, of the reading of this particular passage of Vidyapati from Girdilata, 
uh, uh, he's not equating the language that he uses, Avarta, with Deshi as such, with the Desila. He says, I use an Avarta that mixes various registers, and that's what makes it interesting. And my understanding is that, because everyone uh, understood this, uh, this statement where he says, uh, uh, Desila Bayana, Sabajana et etc. As, as, oh yes, uh, I, it's great because the Deshi, everyone likes it. Hey, 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 it's Vidyapati talking. Mm -hmm. He's not talking to everyone and anyone. And before this, he says, uh, etc. Uh, in the Kali age, uh, there are poisons everywhere, etc. His point is to advocate, is to some extent, to make a point for distinction. So the, when he says uh, the Desila is, is understood by everyone, it's not as such a very good thing. I mean, it sh poetry should not be too accessible. There is a sense of it has to be crafted. It, it is you're speaking to, to Rafikas, etc. And so uh, this idea of a small, a small, uh, I mean, of distance, of looking at things from, and we see that the actual life of this Deshi uh, poetry immediately crosses the boundaries of the of the local. And they become, they become super-regional literary idioms immediately. And they're valued because of that. And uh, you see that those literatures are cultivated not only w where they originate, but also you know, in their neighboring regions. And so this idea of little, of shift is important. Uh, once again, I have yeah. because that would be not only say about the he graded it to some extent, maybe or may not. Number one. <coughs> two, he said also, Parachanda Vijjava Ikasha, Sumura Hilakva Durjana. What does it mean? Asha is specially of Vidyapati's Kasha. It is very true. He also uh, uttered this uh, very nice tweet. Is it? Then Kasha and Desi are intermingled together. Is it? It is just question. You please. Can we take questions from our young scholars? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I had a question for Professor Thibo. Um, I was thinking like in the Islamic polity usually there's a lot of uh, borrowing of light in the concept in the uh, formation of divine kingship. So um, I was thinking uh, whether it be Alankua or uh, the Suravardi philosophy. So there's a lot of um, contribution of the idea of light in Noor or Far in the uh, creation of the kingship and the statehood in general. Uh, so I was thinking if Noor Nama as a text uh, does it go beyond the religious uh, con like uh, pretext or or and it contributes as a political artifact as well like does it shape the kingship at both the regional or the central level like because the circulation is widespread yeah. the, the thing is, sir, is actually I think it's the other way around there, there, are, there, there are instrumentalizing the, 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 <coughs> the example and the story of Mahmoud of Hazna mm -hmm. to show that it is a, a spiritually powerful text uh, I don't. I don't see uh, a political in, uh, use of the of, of the text as such, and an interface with other uh, images of uh, political propaganda or uh, or, uh, or simply of articulation of uh, political discourse with with uh, with uh, spirituality. Uh, I think it would be more the other way, the other way around. They are using those images of. Political figures from the past who say, "Oh, see how powerful this this uh, this text is," uh, but I, I I don't I don't think there is otherwise really. Or uh, so is there no instance of adoption of the text as a um, as a matter of practice in the courtly cultures in the realms also like? Uh, and I'm not saying it's not possible to find it because also I don't want. I think there is no. It's very porous all this. And uh, yeah, the uh, Abdul Hakim Al Lavi, of mm -hmm. course, was a part of it. But he's not directly referring to the Nulama. There are some textual 
points of convergence that, that solve. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, uh, rega uh, regarding no drama, Professor uh, Thibbert, I, I found certain interesting things like uh, therefore represent uh, uh, reference to prophets, like therefore uh, like in uh, uh, in Quranic uh, prophets like Moses, Jesus, and therefore uh, David, where uh, therefore uh, different regions therefore uh, like for example David was ref uh, uh, the word of God was dis disseminated in the form of uh, Zabur in Greek language and, and uh, Moses therefore in Uriyan and therefore so he uh, is he referring uh, uh, not 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 referring but uh, is he narrating a different form of a Quran because as opposed to the traditional Usmani Quran which is uh, therefore like because they are all these three prophets come from the from the children of Israel like because uh, and second thing what are uh, and uh, you have also mentioned about certain yogic asanas so I'm interested to know about is there any reference of yogic postures in Noornama or? So, uh, the second question, are there specific references to yogic posture? No, it's not really a manual as we have in, in other texts, uh, like the Jokalanda, etc., where there is a clear description of yogic practices. Here you m you have references to, to the principles of yoga through uh, biocosmology and and uh, references to um, the Nadis and, uh, and and things <laughs> like that, but uh, it's it's not very detailed in uh, in that respect. Um, the the other question about uh, uh, I I don't <coughs> know I, I mean uh, if what you were suggesting is that if, if he's aware of other recensions because uh, yeah. because uh, the thing that because they know Arabic. Now, therefore, Quran is written in Arabic also, therefore, and clearly it is written that, uh, therefore, um, I uh, gave this book to the children of Israel. Yeah. That is, uh, therefore, Moses, therefore, he was a prophet, and he, uh, and similarly, David and Jesus were, you know, Jewish prophets. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, uh, but here, therefore, it is written like, uh, uh, like in yeah. Greek and, therefore, uh, Suryani. Uh, yeah. So but, uh, but yeah. But the awareness that those revealed texts, it's funny because uh, to, to see what language is associated with which text, because it makes sense historically always in one way or, no, or another, um, uh, that uh, the Torah is uh, associated with Hebrew, uh, that uh, the, so the, the Psalms with Greek, it's, quite, it's a bit strange, uh, I must say. And then the, the Gospel in, with Syriac, with indeed we have. Uh, um, uh, but uh, I, I think here he's just reflecting a, an awareness of uh, of this linguistic diversity of the the previous revealed text. Even uh, yeah, if it, after it, you have different uh, accounts, but uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have a small codicological question. Uh, in cases of illustrated manuscripts, especially the ones in 18th and 19th century, um, there are often manuscripts where the illustrations are added later, and it's a textual manuscript. Uh, so in the, that process, is the text sort of, uh, at times the texts are retouched in terms of adding decorations to the margins and all. Are there examples where um, the text have been sort of compromised to sort of amp up the value of the manuscript by adding illustrations and decorations to the manuscripts? Naldaman. Is it the Naldaman? The, Naldaman. Yeah. the illustrations, we found this out looking at the manuscript uh, a few months ago, um, were pasted in later right over the text yes. by someone who didn't probably didn't know what the text was because they didn't even know where to break it. And it was probably, it was uh, Ulrika Tarn suggested this, um, you know, based on the way the, the book market, the art market, when they were, yes, trying to increase the value of the manuscript before they sold it to a dealer who would then sell it as yeah. a demand to the museum. Yeah, because yeah, so I have also found some manuscripts which are similar. Yeah. Where 
Oh, yeah. really? Okay, I would like to ask you about that because we also have at least 18th century yeah, 18th cases century. of this as well, where people were later uh, owners would do things that yeah. to me at least seem destructive, yeah. To yeah. destructive through the manuscript, yeah. but they the were clearly seen to enhance yeah. yeah. Like the Shahnama manuscript in the National Museum, in which Maharaja Ranjit Singh's illustration has been edited. So there are many such uh, cases where the possessor has got added his work. <coughs> Even apart from that, they will add as the writer of the book even. Mm. Recently I brought a manuscript of Maratka, Delhi, Kesala mm. Salarajan from British Library. Mm. It is written in uh, 1813 mm. and written that it is the property and the writing by Moshe Dali Khan. While every one of us know that it is by Darga Kuli Khan. Mm -hmm. But he writes as a tasneef a Murshid Kuli Khan. Mm -hmm. So this has been a kind of a possessiveness, extra possessiveness, when they will add also this one. Or like uh, there is a uh, Ramayan copy in Allahabad Museum, Alava State Archives. It is from 1680s. It's very interesting, uh, 1780s, sorry. And it's interesting that there's a picture of Nadir Shah mm. in that. <laughs> Nadir Shah uh, riding on an elephant, moving in Lahore market, in Ramayan copy from 1780s. And it's by copies by Masih Panipati. Mm -hmm. But also imagine Ranji Singh in Shahnama, mm -hmm. Nadir Shah in Ramayan. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think uh, I want to thank uh, the presenters uh, again and thank you for the, the thoughtful questions and, um, uh, and end with two uh, quick announcements. One, um, if I could again ask the presenters to stop by the table uh, before you leave. I don't think there are many of us here, so that shouldn't be difficult. We need to have a quick meeting. And for um, all the rest of us, we're going to be meeting again tomorrow at 9.30. If you could come just a little bit early, we'll, get, uh, we'll give you your certificates, those of you uh, who need them. Uh, and um, let's see. Uh, and I think that's about it. So tomorrow we're going to have, again, uh, the pairing of Persian and Bengali which is a strong combination, as we've seen today. Um, and yeah, uh, have a good night. Thank you again. We'll see you in the morning. Oh. <laughs>